Good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of the Centre for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship, Frederick van Sel Slabert Henri Lecture, and also our 10th year celebrations. I'm Heidi October and I'm the Deputy Director at the Centre and also heading the Frederick van Sel Slabert Institute. But tonight, I'm especially honored to co-directing uh, tonight's program with my colleague on this side, um, Spurgeon Haddon Wilson. From my side, good evening, everyone. As Heidi mentioned, I am Spurgeon Haddon Wilson, and I am the program manager at the Frederick von Sale Slubbert Institute. And it is an honor and a privilege for me to be your co-program director at this momentous um, event alongside Heidi. Spurgeon, can you believe that um, today, exactly 10 years ago, the Frederick van Sel Slabert Institute was officially launched by the late Professor Russell Botman as one of the HOPE projects exactly 10 years ago? And I am particularly impressed by the fact that so many of our students, alumni, donors and friends literally from the north, south, east and west from more than 10 countries are joining us tonight and um, in sharing the celebrations with us. Thank you, Heidi. And if I look back in the 10 years, how have we grown? Yes. Um, but let's take a moment and give our guests a brief overview of our development and growth over the last 10 years with a short video clip that we have prepared. So enjoy, everyone. Dr. Frederick van Sale Slubbard was a man who embodied the value of the South African constitution before it even existed. Throughout his life, he fought for the equality of all races and the right to human dignity. He used his intellect and influence to break the bonds of the apartheid regime. And through his actions, one can describe him as a critical thinker and an engaged citizen of South Africa. That constitution must allow for full citizenship Irrespective of race. Irrespective of race and no domination. Frederick von Slubbard grew up in Petersburg, Pretoria with a love for rugby and cricket. He continued his studies at the University of Stellenbosch and in 1967, he obtained a doctorate in sociology. He used the knowledge obtained from his alma mater to question and challenge the laws of the National Party. In 1979, his vision of a free and democratic South Africa propelled him to become the leader of the Progressive Party. However, after realizing that he would need more than just a voice in Parliament to push the government to reform, he left his party in 1986. The following year, he organized a Dakar meeting, an historic event where a number of South Africans of all races came together in solidarity against the apartheid regime. There is a sadness that we have to meet so far from our common fatherland. This in itself is a tragic commentary on the history we share. Some of you have traveled far and suffered much pursuing freedom for your country. And despite whatever differences there may be, we have come to talk to you because we realize your critical role in finding a resolution to our tragedy. On 12th May, 2008, Dr. Fonsal Slavert became the Chancellor of the University of Stellenbosch, where he held his position until he passed away on 14 May 2010. Gone, but never forgotten. His legacy lives on through the founding of the Frederick von Sale Slavert Institute. Over the past decade, the Institute's range of leadership offerings to youth leaders globally include a range of critical engagements, such as discourses, leadership summits, and short courses recognized on the academic transcript. This has equipped students to follow in Van Sale Slavit's footsteps, embodying the essence of a true South African citizen. Ten years later, with a growing participation rate, national and international partnerships, innovative programming recognized on academic transcript, and fond memories of thousands of students who honed their leadership skills critically engaging on societal matters, Ten years later, we are so proud to confirm 
Fancel Slabert's legacy lives on, and it finds expression through collaborative work with our students, our academics, and youth organizations across South Africa. Rather, more importantly so, through every single student who leaves the university with more than just a degree. Youth leaders who reflect critically on their role as citizens through the lens of our constitution and through that addressing democracy, human rights, social justice and ensuring that that becomes part of the lived lives of citizenry. The Frederick von Selslubert Institute forms a part of the Centre Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship. Together, they strive to inspire and equip responsible leaders and global citizens. A goal of Stellenbosch University and a focus area within student affairs is the transformative student experience at the Centre for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship. Our centre is a dedicated space that anchors for practitioners and students the process of leveraging the experience of engagement, leadership, governance and participation into competency. The Frederick von Sell Slubbard Institute was launched in March 2011 as one of Stellenbosch University's HOPE projects. This institute promotes the development of student leadership and enables graduates to contribute as active citizens to the well-being of society. The intention was clear to expand the leadership footprints beyond the South African borders. After the passing of the late Frederick von Sell Slubbert in 2010, Stellenbosch University agreed that it would be fitting to honour his legacy by establishing the von Sell Slubbert Student Leadership Institute. The idea was and remains that through the institute we would enhance and advance student leadership at this university, feeding from the legacy of the late von Sell Slubbert. Then it was linked to what was the HOPE project at Stellenbosch University, which was really a targeted attempt to make sure that Stellenbosch University understands that we should serve society better. Science for Society was the key cornerstone of the HOPE project, um, coordinated and enhanced by the late Professor Russell Bortmann. Today, Project von Sell Slubbert's pursuit of responsible, critical thinkers and accountable citizens is realized by the programs offered by the Frederick von Sell Slubbert Institute. The FEZS course offerings were really the springboard to my leadership journey. It taught me the importance of engaging with people who are different to me and people who hold different beliefs and opinions. That had an impact when I had to negotiate difficult situations and develop solutions. When we started the Institute many years ago, what stood out for me was the Emerging Marty program and how the students that came through the program with the potential how they grew and how they became influential student leaders, but also now influential South African citizens. Frederick Marcel Slubert was not a man who believed in teaching things only in theory. He was a man of action. Thus, the Frederick Marcel Slubert Institute did exactly the same. Student leadership development was taught in the courses, but then students were immediately called to action to take those teachings and implement them in their communities. This was my experience. All the courses I attended and everything I learned, I was able to immediately apply in my faculty, my residence, within PSO spaces, and as my time as a student leader. These are the skills that are taught at the Institute. They are transferable and they are immediately effective. So today, 10 years later, we celebrate youth leadership in South Africa, and we'd like to thank all of our partners for your continued support and encouragement to ensure that the work we do collaboratively remains relevant beyond the South African higher education space. Thank you. Well, I really hope that you enjoyed that short overview of our journey. And Heidi, what an amazing journey it has been. Um, and for me, an absolute privilege and honor to have been part of this growth and development of this institute and the legacy of the late Frederick van Sel um, of the last 10 years. So on our, on our program next, we have our rector and vice chancellor, Prof. Wim de Villiers, that will be doing our welcome address on behalf of Stellenbosch University. Welcome, 
to this very special event and lecture of the Friedrich von Sell Slubber Institute. Today's topic is about facilitating responsible governance, and this seems like a more pressing issue than ever before. We are also celebrating 10 years of the Friedrich von Sell Slubber Institute. This is really a remarkable milestone for the Center for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship, and I hope there will be many more to come. The American Reverend Jesse Jackson said, leadership cannot just go along to get along. Leadership must meet the moral challenge of the day. That is what Friedrich von Sell Slubber did, and that is the work his legacy informs, the work that has continued in his name until today. As we all know, Dr. Slubber was a remarkable man. His contribution as an agent of change in the recent history of our country cannot be underestimated. His reputation has withstood the test of time and his legacy has influenced and inspired an exciting new generation of leaders and thinkers. Throughout his career, he has been a passionate advocate for democracy and his engagement with social issues is a testament to this. This legacy has influenced the work that the Institute does and will continue to do. This year's honorary lecture will be delivered by Judge Dennis Davis, former Supreme Court judge and someone who embodies the values of the Friedrich von Sell Slubber Institute. I look forward to what he has to say. Last year, whilst facing the obstacles and challenges of the coronavirus pandemic, personal and collective loss, disruptive learning environments, and an unstable future, the Friedrich von Sell Slubber Institute persevered and continued programs and short courses online. This further increased the participation rate and allowed more students to enroll. Stellenbosch University positions itself as an educational leader on the African continent. This is in line with the Institute's vision to support the development of leadership in Africa and to cultivate active citizens contributing to a socially just and sustainable society. I wish the Institute well with all future endeavors and look forward to seeing the leaders that you produce. Thank you so much, Prof. Wim de Villiers. And I want to echo, indeed, Frederick van Sale has left a legacy and it's still living on, and I believe for years still to come. Next on our program, we um, want to welcome our senior director for the division Student Affairs, Dr. Choice Makgeta, to contextualize our FEZS Institute Honorary Lecture for 2021. Dr. Choice. Good day. The Frederick van Sayle Slabert Institute is turning 10 years this year. And this institute has gone through different phases of uh, change and eventually repositioning itself to be right at the heart of student life. The milestones achieved are many. And the student, the institute, has become a place for robust discussions, critical thought, a, an inclusive environment where students feel free and comfortable to explore difficult and sensitive topics, to question societal issues, and to strengthen their leadership qualities. It is an environment where experiential education and learning is a reality, where students and staff and even civil society work together as equals and also from design to implementation. The Institute has gone to lengths to do a program uh, a renewal process, which ensured uh, that the streamlined courses, streamlined offerings, and made sure that they continue to be relevant and of high quality. Many leaders refined their voices and actually found their voices in the vibrant discussions that are happening at the Institute. Each year, the Frederick van Sale Slabert annual lecture 
topics. Stretch our minds. Leaders of high caliber have been invited and, and shared their views, shared their thoughts, their experiences, their knowledge, and their wisdom, leaving us with tough questions to digest for the rest of the year. The annual lecture grew in depth and strength and became one of the prestigious annual lectures of Stellenbosch University. As we celebrate 10 years of the Institute and of the annual lecture, we are yet again grateful to have great leaders in conversation. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the milestones achieved as we enjoy the conversation uh, we are invited to for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Macheta, for your well wishes and for also contextualizing this year's honorary lecture. We have now reached the highlight of tonight's program, and that's the honorary lecture by Judge Dennis Davis. Judge Davis was appointed as High Court Judge in 1998 by former South African President Nelson Mandela and as President of the Competition Appeal Court in 2000. Since his appointment to the bench, he has continued to teach constitutional law and tax law at the University of Cape Town, where he is currently an honorary professor of law. He served as a legal advisor on electoral law and federalism to the Constitutional Assembly during the formation of South Africa's new constitution and has been visiting lecture um, at the University of Harvard, Cambridge, Florida, Toronto, and Georgetown. Without any further ado, we look forward to this year's honorary lecture. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for honoring me, giving this lecture in honor of Dr. Fonsell Slubbit. I'm somewhat privileged actually in this regard because I knew Dr. Slubbit rather well. And I suppose bearing in mind that I'm doing the lecture in Stellenbosch, I should say the very first time I met Dr. Slubbit was actually in Stellenbosch when he was teaching here as a young, very charismatic academic, which he was throughout his life, I might add. Uh, the reason was there had been protests at uh, St. George's Cathedral from those of us in the University of Cape Town. To be honest, I can't remember what they were about, probably detention without trial or something similar. Students, including myself, had to run for our lives as the police moved in to assault us, which was a fairly unprecedented event at that point for white students, which itself is an interesting point. Of course, black students had a much tougher time given our racist society. And the next day, it was decided that some of us should come to the University of Stellenbosch to inform them of the nature of what we were trying to do. And we were told that there was this very dynamic, progressive sociology lecturer, Dr. Frederick von Sales Slubbert, who'd meet us and who was very supportive of our initiatives. And that was the very first time I met Dr. Slubbert. And not to say much more, but it was also the very first time I got arrested and thrown into the a Stellenbosch police station cell overnight uh, for my pains, which was a salutary lesson. It wasn't the last time I was arrested, but nonetheless it was the first and perhaps therefore for me the most significant. And I then got to know Dr. Slubbert very well and it's a privilege to give this lecture in his honour. It is also, I think, particularly opportune that the lecture which I have to give in a very shortened form this time given our COVID exigencies has to do with electoral reform. And that's for two reasons. The main one is that Dr. Slubbert himself, after he'd retired from uh, politics, active politics, and was involved in a whole manner of activities during our democratic era, chaired the famous Slubbert Commission on Electoral Reform, of which more in a moment, but which has become the central feature of so much of our debate about electoral reform. The second is because I myself, just serendipitously, happened to be one of the two ANC representatives, legal representatives, in, in the group at Cadessa, together with Dr. Frini Jinwala, uh, Mr. Eric Re uh, uh, Rosenthal, on behalf of the uh, Democratic Alliance, and, uh, or I think the party at the time, and King Jlovo and part of the IFP being the other two members of our team, and we were the ones who drafted the first electoral act for a democratic South Africa. I might also add 
that that act, although it was amended, the core of the act remains exactly as it was then, and therefore perhaps I have a certain personal interest and involvement in the process of electoral reform. Now, the topic chosen by the organisers could not be more propitious, and the reason for that primarily is because of an important constitutional court judgment that came down last year. And I need, therefore, perhaps for a couple of minutes to talk about that before moving on to its implications. In this particular case, the so-called New Nation case, the Constitutional Court was confronted with the following question. Whether, to the extent that it allows individuals to be elected to the National Assembly and provincial legislatures only through members of political parties, is the Electoral Act therefore constitutional or as the court expressed it differently, does this channeling to membership for political parties infringe certain rights enjoyed under the Bill of Rights by individuals? More specifically, would there be and can there be and should there be independent candidates for election to the National Assembly in the light of the framing of this question? And looming large over the dispute before the Constitutional Court, of course, with Section 19 of the Constitution, to the extent relevant, reads, every citizen is free to make political choices, which includes the right to form a political party, to participate in the activities or recruit members for a political party. And then it goes on to say, every adult citizen has the right to vote in elections for any legislative body established in terms of the Constitution, and to do so in secret. And here's the important point, to stand for public office and have elected to hold office. Now, that was the real question. What did that mean? Now, Judge Madlanga, Mubiseli Madlanga, who gave the judgment, sorry, Mubiseli Madlanga, who gave the judgment on behalf of the majority of the court, framed the debate in terms of Section 19 and, of course, also Section 18 of the Constitution, the Guarantee of Freedom of Association. And he said the following. Once an adult citizen is forced to exercise the Section 19.3b right, that is the right to hold public office, through a political party that divests him or her of the very choice guaranteed by the section not to form or to join a political party. That cannot be. And he went on to say, choosing to associate is an exercise of the right to freedom of association. Choosing to disassociate from that which you earlier associated is also an exercise of that right. Choosing not to associate at all, too, is an exercise of the right. The restraint on any of these choices is a negation of the right. So, for those of you not lawyers, and bearing in mind the fact that I would normally take a, probably a half an hour to explain this judgment, let me, therefore, having honed in on the essence of the ratio, the uh, principal legal reasoning of the judgment, let me just try to summarise. What just Judge Museli Madlanga said on behalf of the majority of the court was simply put the following. You have section 19 which guarantees the right to stand for public office, you have a right of association to associate or disassociate as you so choose. If you take the two together, it must follow that imposing a restriction through the Electoral Act that the only way you can basically be appointed or, or elected to the National Assembly is through a political party is in breach of these two rights. And therefore, following that logic, the majority of the court declared that the Electoral Act was unconstitutional and to the extent that it requires that adult citizens may be elected to the National Assembly and provincial assemblies only through their membership of political parties. So, effectively the Constitutional Court said, you cannot have an electoral system that mandates only one route to get to the National Assembly through an election, namely to be a member of a political party, gave Parliament a period of time to fix this up to accommodate the idea of independent candidates. Let me make one other point in relation to this very important judgment, because there is an important minority judgment by Justice Froneman, which I think um, would allow us to have a broader debate at a given time uh, in relation to this particular question. And what Justice Froneman says is that Section 19, the section of association to which I've already refers, compels no one to form or join a political party. If I ever someone exercises the right not to associate with political parties, the Constitution itself provides the consequence. That person must then pursue 
the direct democratic means available under the Constitution, and that not of standing for electoral office. In other words, what Justice Froneman was saying there was that there's one route to promote democracy, which is through being a member uh, of the National Assembly, but there are a multitude of other avenues uh, which promote democracy, all of which are guaranteed or safeguarded in the Constitution because the right of freedom of association, uh, the right of freedom of speech, expression, and a whole plethora of these rights ensures that you and I can, in fact, participate in the democratic discourse of South Africa and can participate politically. It is wrong to suggest that the only form of democracy is simply to be a member of parliament. And he also said the following, that section 42.3 provides of the, of the constitution, the National Assembly is elected to represent the people and ensure the government by the people under the constitution. He then says, this speaks to the rationale of promoting democracy and the equality of political rights. Every vote counts equally in proportional representation with this representativeness optimized, optimizing rule by the citizen. And therefore, there's one, there's, there, there is a, a route that that should follow, and that does not necessarily mean that you've got to, as it were, impose this idea of an independent candidate on uh, the electoral system. It is a controversial issue, and one which I do not have uh, too much time to amplify upon. But what has happened as a result of the, these, these judgments, perhaps, are a couple of things. Concentrating on the majority judgment first, let me say the following. There have now been a series of proposals put up, and rightly so, because the parliament is now obliged to bring the Electoral Act into alignment with the order of the majority of the judgments which I read out to you. Namely, that you can't simply have a system which is predicated exclusively and wholly on representation through political parties. And two proposals have caught the eye. There's one which was developed by Ruth Mayer, another by the Helen Sussman Foundation, and of course there's also a third one by COPE. Uh, I think Terry Lakota MP has also produced a, a proposal. And what is significant about these proposals is that they recall in clarion detail that which Dr. Van Sale Slubbert and his team recommended so many years ago when they sought to exploit the idea that proportional representation did not have to only be by party lists, that it was important for the principle of accountability to also have a component of the electoral system based on constituencies. And I am simplifying, of course, their proposals, as I have to. But let me just say a brief word or two about the two proposals which I've mentioned, the Mayor Report and the, Sussman, uh, the Helen Sussman Foundation Report. Uh, the Roof Mayors panel believes that an electoral model purely based on the constituency system would not make it possible to meet the constitutional prescript of the outcome to reflect in general proportionality it would also not result in a sufficiently diverse legislature. And I must say, that was the foundational principle which guided us when we drafted the Electoral Act. We wanted to have as diverse a legislature as possible, and there was a belief that the first-past-the-post system, which had been so ruthlessly exploited by the National Party in white elections, I might add, um, recall that it was only in 1958 for the first time, 10 years after the National Party took power, that they actually had a majority of votes as opposed to constituencies. And it was that kind of history that it informed us. So Mayer reflects that, the Mayer report, and then says, a singular proportional representation system now accommodating independent candidates would be impractical. So if you just simply had that. So they have suggested in place, and here is the sounds of Dr. Van Sale Slubbert echoing through the years when they say the solution is a 400-seat National Assembly of which 300 seats are allocated via the constituency system and 100 seats via proportional representation. On their scheme, the constituency system would see the establishment of 66 multi-member constituencies with three to seven representatives to be elected to each constituency. 
and the constituency would be demarcated along present district and metropolitan municipal lines. According to their calculations, based on the total registered voters in the 19, sorry, 2019 general election, 26,756,649 to be exact, each multi-member constituency would have between 270,000 and 624,000 voters. And their argument is that would be the best route to go uh, for the 300, and then the 100 seats left over would be determined by the combined number of votes received by a party across all multi-member constituencies divided proportionately. That's the sort of uh, combination system. The Helen Sussman Foundation uh, has a pretty similar report. Uh, they've got 55 multiple member constituencies. I'm not going to go into the details. What I want to say is that they suggest that independent candidates can participate in the electoral system in one of two ways, with candidates making a choice of how they wish to participate accordingly. One, they can stand for election in individual constituencies. Two, they may stand effectively as parties, like sort of a loose alliance, and therefore have a list. The first option would be suitable for independent candidates with a geographical base in a particular constituency. Second, suitable for candidates with support spread out over the country and obviously trying to capture votes accordingly. Now, so much then for the various proposals. I haven't got time to go into Mr. Lakota's um, submissions, but they're all essentially, which is so interesting given the nature of our lecture tonight, they all effectively reflect the thinking of some 20 odd years ago, which I suppose in many ways just illustrates uh, the uh, quality, thinking, the intellectual quality, the political astuteness of the man who we've come to honour tonight. I want to, if I may, in the last few minutes available to me, and there are few, just say, draw a few implications. Firstly, would this proposed system, which has to take place one way or another given the constitutional order, would it impose a greater level of accountable governance? Well, there's one thing it would do. It would reduce the influence of party bosses. There's no quite question about this. We wouldn't have situations where the secretary general of a particular political party would order MPs to vote in a particular way. Uh, I, I'm thinking, obviously, of the public protector case. The MPs themselves would have to do that, and they should do that. That's their role. It, but I'm not sure, and here's the question for debate, whether on its own, although the principle of, of, of um, developed by the Mayor report, the Sussman report, broadly uh, capturing the Slubbert report, that this would improve accountability, that it might well uh, ensure that MPs would have a, somewhat of an eye on their constituency and therefore not just on the party bosses and that their career in Parliament may be somewhat more independent than otherwise would be the case. That is true. And all the talk that we've now got in the Zonda Commission about the failure of our parliamentary system to render the executive and others accountable, well, of course, in this is not about technical nonsense about having extra committees in Parliament. It has two factors, it seems to me, that we have to answer. One is, would this system improve the outcome and the answers yet? Yes. But two, would it improve the outcome to ensure a full-throated democratic set of principles of accountability and transparency in our government? I have doubts about that. We have to go far further, and therefore it seems to me our debate needs to range beyond a simple binary of an electoral system change and uh, stay where we are. And then there are two further questions I'd like to pose by way of conclusion. The debate itself about electoral reform, not just in South Africa, but all over the world, takes place in the context of the future of political parties to embrace voter aspirations in the context of a clear decline in confidence and trust in governments the world over. It seems that, generally speaking, political parties no longer can be trusted uh, to do what they should be doing, which is be a conveyor belt uh, for the voters and for the electorate. And there does seem to me 
to be a serious problem with the nature of political parties as such. I read just today, as I recorded this lecture, a letter, uh, sorry, an article in the Daily Maverick saying quite rightly that the electoral system on its own is not a sine qua non, and then com saying, but neither are the existing political parties, so we need a political realignment. True, that, of course, is a lecture all on its own, but we need to raise the point. And I think that then that raises another point, which certainly we've seen in the United States of America and to some extent in this country too. In the United States of America, just as an illustration, it does now appear, if you look at all the opinion polls, that on, on economics, the idea of addressing our inequality and poverty has now forced economists, thank goodness, to move away from the Washington Consensus and from austerity-type programs which have basically restricted all forms of inclusive growth and democratic economies the world over. And so, if you take that situation in America, the Democrats now, pursuing this line of argument, seem to have garnered sufficient or considerable support in relation thereto. But everybody says that that makes no difference to the outcome of the elections because of the cultural discourse in which... Voters, in a sense, now vote according to the way they see the cultural discourse uh, uh, playing out. That is, uh, so in the United States of America, the idea is that this idea of a cancel culture, the idea that there is some hegemonic uh, viewpoint pursued by the left, means that the rest feel that they're outside of the stream and therefore run back into reactionary politics notwithstanding that the reactionary politics propagates an economics which is actually counter to their own interests. And we need to ask ourselves in South Africa that perhaps when we talk about electoral reform, will that itself contribute to a richening of our discourse, a capturing of a sort of non-racial, non-sexist society based on equality, dignity, uh, and freedom? It seemed to me that those were the ideals, not only which were captured in the Constitution, but which were a consistent theme through the entire career of Dr. Van Sale Slubbert, and it's therefore appropriate that we reflect on this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Davis, and uh, quite an amount of uh, themes that we can pull from, from your lecture. Uh, to sum up, uh, citizenship, accountability, building a responsive South African society, what does that look like? Cancel culture and activism, is that the way forward? Um, perhaps another one is youth participation and the power of the youth vote, but I'm sure we're going to elaborate more on that. So Spurgeon, I think um, perhaps also just a reminder for our audience, please don't forget to start posting your questions in the chat, in the chat function. Before we um, move over to the live conversation part, um, we also invited Judge Rudolf Mellinghoff from Germany to share some of his insights. So Judge Mellinghoff is a former justice of the Federal Constitutional Court and former president of the Federal Supreme Finance Court in Germany. So let's hear what he has to say. Dear listeners and viewers, I'm honored to contribute a short greeting to your event. Electoral design is rich and deep topic. Given the many electoral designs available, I find that sensible debate is enriched by comparing systems internationally. Much like the German constitution was of great interest to the writers of the South African constitution, I hope that the German electoral system will once again be considered. Elections are the foundation of every democracy under the rule of law. Through elections, citizens determine the persons that make up state bodies and elections determine who will exercise state power. In modern democracies, the party political composition of parliament is the predominant factor that decides who is in power. Electoral procedures are the way that votes translate into seats in Parliament. Electoral procedures are used in an intentional manner to achieve and to promote a governing majority in Parliament or to even create such majorities in the first place. 
what type of electoral systems can be considered. The electoral systems that are most generally known are majority voting and proportional representation. This, however, is only a very rough typology. As we see, variations exist in majority voting systems, but proportional representation systems have an even greater range of variations. In South Africa, the discussion is dominated by a further range of options. The mixing of majority voting and proportional representation. Personalities as well as parties play a major role on who represents the will of the people. The German electoral system caters for this by allowing independent candidates to run for parliament through a constituency, which means that the candidate is selected for parliament not by a party but by voters in the constituency. This system would address the findings of the new nation's case by the South African Constitutional Court. When considering independent candidates, the nature of the MP's role is important. According to the German constitution, each member of parliament is tasked to represent all voters. They are subject only to their consigns. This is called the free mandate, which rejects all attempts to make the parliamentarian a mere functionary of any collective body. The discussion of electoral reform is both far-ranging and specific. My greeting barely scratches the surface. But don't look away. Electoral reform has fundamental effects on democracy, on accountability and on you. For now, I will leave it at these remarks. I wish this event very success and hope of exciting discussions. Thank you, Judge Mellinger, for your insights. I'm also um, very happy to see that we've got some questions already in the chat, so thank you also for that. But without any further ado, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Kristen Sharpley, the Frederick van Sel Slabbert Program Coordinator, uh, who will also be our moderator tonight. Over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Heidi, and a warm welcome to Judge Dennis Davis, as well as Ibra political analyst and governance expert Ibrahim Fakir. Ibrahim is currently the director of programs at the Orwell Socioeconomic Research Institute, and until October 2016, he was the head of the political parties and parliamentary program at the Electoral Institute, where he edited and published the election updates, focusing on analyzing South African elections. He, is, or he was also an editorial advisor to the independent startup Media House Daily Vox, and regularly contributes analysis, opinion, and comment articles to various news outlets. We are really honored for both of you for joining us this evening. So, I have some questions that I would like to tackle before we go to our virtual audience. And once again, a reminder to please put those questions in the chat and we'll get to them very soon. So this evening we've been engaged in a topic that affects all citizens, not just within South Africa, but also globally. So I'd like to start with um, a question specifically for, for Ibrahim, but please Judge Davis, feel free to, to jump in. So Ibrahim, in a Daily Maverick, I found, I found an article um, that you published in 2014, which was very interesting. And the article uh, where you state that ele an electoral system is a process which serves to facilitate people's participation and is a process that creates the equality of opportunity for citizens to exercise choice and give voice to their choice. So my question is, what power does a change in our electoral system give to the people? And elaborating a bit more on that in terms of what essentially are the pros and cons of a proportional system versus a, a proportional voting system versus a mixed voting system? Thank you very much for having me. Um, and I really appreciate, appreciate this opportunity. I'm happy also to say that I started my career at an institute which was started by the late Dr. Fanzel Slabbert at the Institute for Democracy in South Africa. That's actually where I began my career. But nevertheless, 
Thank you for your question. Uh, you know, we often think of an electoral system as some kind of technical instrument, when in fact, as you rightly point out, it is not. It is an instrument which is allowed to give people a chance to participate, to come together. So in a sense, it promotes a degree of social solidarity. In a divided society like ours, it's an opportunity for people to come together across the different identity cleavages and be together in expressing choice on the one hand and voice on the other hand. Now, if people are going to be able to express choice, surely they need to be exposed and be able to engage with a series of different opinions, offerings, policies, what people would normally call political and policy outreach from the parties. But at the same time, they need the opportunity to be able to hold the political parties' feet to the fire during a campaign um, opportunity. But once parties are elected into office, citizens should and ought to have a right to be able to hold them to account. Now, obviously, in a pure proportional representation system, which is of a closed party list, that opportunity is very small, as in, in fact, very limited. That's the disadvantage. The advantage, of course, is that it is broadly representative, it is very inclusive, it promotes a degree of diversity, all of the votes count, that much is true. But as Justice Davis has pointed out, it gives political party elites and leaders an extraordinary amount of power over those public representatives. And what the judge from Germany is talking about is a constrained mandate, particularly when it comes to oversight, which is where our manifest governance failings have been, because individual MPs find it very difficult to raise difficult questions about their seniors in the executive arm of government. First past the post systems, on the other hand, while they're not terribly fair because a lot of votes get wasted, people who hold seats can win by very slim margins, so there isn't really a broadly reflected will of the people. But it does, however, provide a geographic link between the constituency or community and the representative. The snag with that argument is that in our local government system in South Africa at local level, we have a pure mix between proportional representation and first-past-the-post representation in constituencies. And yet, we're not finding enough accountability and, more importantly, enough responsiveness. And so what do people do? It is also a form of democratic expression, sure, but they take to the streets, they target mayors, they burn public infrastructure, and, of course, that's a function of unresponsive government. So look, the advantages and disadvantages to both. I like the idea of a mixed system that may in fact be adopted. I unfortunately have proposed a fairly or a different system which is, which, is, which is outside of a mixed member proportional system, which requires having 400 or 300 MPs directly elected in constituencies, which makes the size of constituencies smaller, and then to have a top-up proportional representative list. Now, this, the, 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 the one caveat I have to propose is that I'm not proposing a mere plurality first-past-the-post system. That is, the person who has the most votes wins. I'm setting a slightly higher threshold, suggesting that 50% plus one must be the threshold that must be met which must be met, and that will provide not complete representativity as Section 46, one of the Constitution suggests, but some degree of proportionality when you accumulate all of the different constituencies around the country. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim, for, for giving us that insight. Um, Judge Davis, is there anything you'd like to comment Yes, on? I think uh, Brian's right to point to the fact that at local government level, we have modulated or moderated the idea of a simple straight proportional representation system and he's utterly correct that actually our local government operations are generally hopeless. So it just backs up my point that I made earlier. You can't only rely on electoral system and in fact uh, Ibrahim points an interesting one. Should we not just have 300 constituency based and then top it up or 200 and top it up? Um, certainly the Slubbert Commission sort of you know thought about these questions. I think the one thing we should be clear about is the present system isn't working. I think that is absolutely clear. There is no level of accountability. We've had the shocking experience recently 
of a senior person in a party ordering members of parliament to vote in a certain way. You, you can't have that. You, I mean, that, that just makes a mockery of the whole system. And let me tell you something. Uh, if that particular person, we don't know, I, 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 even if as, a, as, a, as a retired judge I should be careful about entering the fray of politics as much as I'm tempted to do so, let me say, if, for example, you sitting in Parliament and you think the person ordering you to vote in a particular way is going to determine whether you get back into Parliament the next time, it's a surefire guarantee as to what you're going to do. So. So I do think uh, uh, that that um, no system is perfect. I do think, you know, a sort of system that Abraham is proposing, or the various ones that I put forward, which have been praised by others, or the Slubbert one, are worthy of considerations. All of them are superior to what we have at the present. Mm. No, thank you. Thank you so much um, to both of you f um, for that insight. I think it 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 ties in with um, another question which which I have, which I found interesting, which which Judge Davis you addressed in your in your in your keynote, where you mention um, cancel culture by the hegemonic left and reactionary politics at play. So something that 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 made me made me think of this is um, when we look at political discourse in 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 South Africa and the concept of governance. Um, it's really relevant at all levels, not just in political circles or forum discussions, but also within student activism, let's say within higher education spaces in South Africa, which has also been a, it's been a prominent topic for, for many years. Um, so my question is, how do we institutionalize a political culture in which we can engage with our representatives and, and governing powers? As you both um, you know, touched on that you know, the system isn't enough. Um, so, so how can how can that engagement take place, and, and how does that shift? Um, yeah, how does how does that contribute to to in institutionalizing a political culture um, that 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 prioritizes in engagement? Uh, you, you're addressing me. You, you can start. I'm you can hoping, start, and then we'll I'm <laughs> hoping Brian was going to answer that. But okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I was going to say was, I mean, I think let's just start with where we were. Take a constituency partly constituency basis it means somebody's got to go and address that constituency they're going to have to go before an, uh, uh, before an election and have meetings and people can go there and say you ruddy hypocrite you promised us this the last time you didn't do it there is a level of accountability which is not unimportant in that regard but you have raised a profound question which is that it doesn't matter what you do with the electoral system unless we address the question of media and when I mean that, I don't only mean the mass media, I mean social media, I mean the multiplicity of means by which people communicate in this internet era. And we are not doing well. We are not doing well. We have not puzzled out how to have a debate that doesn't cancel people out. You know, I'm told, for example, it, it's, because I'm doing some television now, you know, one fault and then it gets onto social media and you can be out, even though you may not have done what you, they claim that you've done. So we're going to have to think through a very serious debate about how media and the various forms of communication are now going to promote the kind of deliberative democracy that you're talking about. Let me just give you one illustration of what I mean. Uh, there's a very thoughtful article by Anne Applebaum, the American theorist, who spoke about the fact that in the 1930s, or 20s, I it was, Radio became the main instrument of communication, new form of communication. And who basically uh, essentially seized it most brilliantly? Goebbels and Mussolini. And they perpetuated exactly the opposite of what you're talking about. And so there had to be a response to that. And that's how public broadcasting came in in the United States, BBC in, in England. Uh, in other words, account of veiling power to the opportunity to seize the radio for fascist and authoritarian and cancel culture purposes, if you wish. We need to start thinking richly about how we are able uh, to, to, to have a discourse. I'm afraid at the moment I'm very fearful. And that's why I raised right at the end of the lecture the point about cancel culture. I'm not interested in the left or the right. Both are problematic in this particular regard. The mm -hmm. question is that it's so easy in South Africa today to single out somebody. People are called clever blacks or Uncle Toms or racists because they're white. And you've cancelled them out. And then, even though you may be the most corrupt of all politicians, somehow you get away with it scot-free. And we need to figure out how to deal with that. Mm. 
No, thank you so much, Judge Davis. Uh, Ibrahim, do you want to comment? The interesting thing about your question, Chris, is you're talking about institutionalizing a culture. And yes, of course, there's certain regulatory or governance architecture interventions which, are, which can help and aid the institutionalization of culture. But culture really resides amongst people. So we've got to think about two things. A, is we have to think about being more discreet and more deliberative in the way in which we promote this. Now, both on the left, you've got cancel culture, and on the right, politically, ideologically speaking, you have denialism. Yeah. So, And both are unhelpful political discourse, right? So if you want to institutionalize this, firstly, we've got to consider at the level of society, at the level of culture, a greater amount of discretion. That the automatic idea of cancellation like in old political theory, the idea was that a certain degree of intolerance has to be tolerated in order to be able to foster a democratic culture. And similarly here, we can't automatically, because we don't like what someone is saying, cancel them, or on the other hand, engage in rampant denialism. Now, one of the ways, and, Pro, uh, and Justice Davis has pointed out uh, to this, that one of the ways of institutionalizing it is ensuring that political representatives have to engage with the people they purport or claim to represent. And a semi-constituency or a constituency system is one sure way of doing so. But there's an added, added benefit. It's not just about responsiveness and accountability. It's about incentivizing these people in constituencies through what would be called constituency surgeries to ensure that the development projects, the infrastructure, the government services in their particular areas actually work because if they don't, they are likely not to be re-elected by people in that community and they don't depend then on the party bosses to put them high enough up on the proportional list to get re-elected the next time. So that's one way of institutionalizing it. But the second way is for us to take a long, hard look at ourselves and the way in which we engage in political discourse, or whether we either engage in denialism or whether we uh, engage in cancellation. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim and, and Judge Davis um, for, for the insight to that. I think it is it's something which I think if we if we think of citizenship, um, each individual taking ownership for for how can they essentially facilitate um, good governance and hold their leaders essentially accountable at the end of the day, and and that question about um, accountability also also has me just latch on in in, in Judge Davis's um, keynote um, when he spoke about the principles of accountability and that they are where one can exercise political realignment. Um, so my qu next question is, how do we use the electoral system to ensure that our government is accountable to us in terms of its actions and decision-making processes? Well, I think we've been speaking a bit about that. I mean, obviously, both Ibrahim and I have been trying to interrogate the notion to which the structure of the society, is, uh, sorry, structure of the electoral system is going to promote that. I mean, what we know and what we definitely know is if you look at the past 10 years, Parliament failed lamentably to hold the executive and, and various institutions accountable. We know that because we listen every day to what's going on in the Zondo Commission, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, uh, everybody's <laughs> horrified, even though everybody should have known what was going on. So we, we, we need, we need a, a, a vigorous parliamentary system that ultimately does bring about that question of accountability, that mm. an, a member of parliament can get up and say, I do want to know what's going on in SARS or the NPA or the Guptas, and actually doesn't feel that he or she will never be elected again. And by the way, may I say, this doesn't only apply to the ruling party. Mm. We, it applies to all the parties. And we, we got, I can give you as many examples on the other side, right, as I can if I was talking about the ruling party. So I'm not talking about a party. That's a, a fundamental problem. But I think, Chris, the, 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 the real question is, what really upsets me, and it's because I'm probably so old, I remember the NGO sector and the civil society during the 70s and 80s. You know, I remember teaching 
at universities in the late 70s and 80s, knowing there were police security branch people in my classrooms. I, I knew that because when I got detained, then I found out about that. But what I'm trying to say is that the students on the progressive side and the non-governmental organizations, not a democratic front, and the whole plethora of organizations, they just didn't care a damn about that. They were mm. prepared to go out and essentially be vibrant and, and set massive contribution to the collapse of the National Party regime. And, and, and I, we had that vibrance. We saw that with the treatment action campaign in the manner in which they were able to ensure that we got antiretroviral drugs for people living with HIV AIDS. We've lost that. We need far more activism, real activism mm -hmm. on the ground, whether it be students listening to this particular discussion we're having, whether it be churches, whether it be other forms of civil society. The trade union movement, which was the most magnificent arm for the democratic movement in South Africa, as they say in Afrikaans, cake who like hulle no. Mm. And that's the problem. So we've got to be able to resurrect that at the same time. You need a vibrant civil society to hold. In the, and by the way, I should not be uh, misunderstood. I do think during the Zuma era, we saw parts of that when people went onto the streets, when people protested and said enough's enough. It's that sort of sustained activism that we had for 20 years in the 70s and 80s into the 90s that I think will sustain us into the future. Mm. Thank you so much for, sh for sharing that insight, um, Judge Davis. Um, Ibrahim, I don't know if you want to, want to comment before we go to our audience. We have some questions that have just come through. I'll try and be as short as possible. First is that we have to stop as individuals, as people, if you talk about political culture, stop hinging your own identity, politically or otherwise, onto that of a political party, firstly. Secondly, when we talk about this electoral reform, we shouldn't bother about what effect it's going to have on political parties, whether it fragments the parties, whether you have a more diverse political party system, or whether it agglomerates the parties towards a three or four party system. That shouldn't be our concern. Our concern must fundamentally be what principles do we give effect to? Are we allowing maximal choice and voice to the voter and at what level? Secondly, how do we uh, promote a degree of responsiveness, not just accountability, but responsiveness, and on the other side, oversight? Because people like to talk about accountability without thinking the, about the institutional effect of supervision, that is the oversight over precisely what Justice Davis is talking about, SARS, the public service, um, any number of, of, of things, but also in your local community, the public school, the public hospital, the clinic, the home affairs office, do they function? Do they open on time? Are they queues manageable? Are the people doing the work that they in fact said they'd be doing? That's what a local representative does. And if you want to institutionalize that, that's the nature of the system that you require. Mm. Thank you. So, thank you so much to both of mm -hmm. you for, for for engaging in some, I think, some very important questions tonight. So just to jump over to to the audience quickly. Um, so one of the the questions we have that have just come through is, and and both any any but either of you could could answer. Um, is it wise to regulate political coalitions through the Electoral Act? Well, I'll let Brian talk about that. He's probably more of an expert <laughs> than I am. I know, I know that the Germans like this, and Justice Davis is being coy, but as a judge or former judge, I'm sure he'd love the idea of regulation because this is just going to be so much more work for him to do. But I mean, as, as a liberal, well, liberal is a putative word in this, in this, in this, uh, and at least a pejorative one in this context, but I mean political liberal. I'm not an economic liberal by any stretch of the imagination. But as a political liberal, we must take regulation with a very light touch. And I don't think we must envisage that we want to control and regulate what political parties do. We must rather engineer the system through the electoral system that will allow and incentivize people to cooperate across different party lines, but also devise a system in such a way that our constituencies are not just multiracial, that they promote a real degree of social integration across race and across economic class. But that would be my view of, of ensuring social compacts amongst people 
rather than formal coalition governance through the electoral system or through the electoral law. Because in part, you know, our local government system through the Municipal Structures and Systems Act actually does give some clues about how executive office must be distributed. So it says that you must in proportion distribute how on the basis of the election result, which executive offices are held by who. But our parties don't follow that letter of the law. They simply go around making coalitions on their own, which is fine. And I'm not so sure that I would like a lot of regulation because it provides far too much administrative and management nightmares for the IEC. They have to start establishing commissions which must then engage in conflict resolution if things come up between them. It's better if they privately decide because parties in our constitutional dispensation are in fact viewed as private entities. They must decide amongst themselves how they want to go about this. It would be nice if they had co coalition agreements which are which are regulated, um, not regulated, but, but regulated through contract, private contract amongst themselves. Kenya, I know, has gone towards regulating formally through the law, uh, coalition pacts. But that doesn't work because look what happens election on election. Today's coalition partners become tomorrow's political enemies, and it doesn't always work. So rather promote social compacts amongst people, constituencies in, uh, constituencies in society. What, what, what Prof. Davis is talking about with regard to labor, civil society, uh, social movements, which are single issue or multiple, whatever the, the, the nature of them are, rather promote those as, as, as associational life and organization in civil society rather than regulate the parties too much. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, I, I think um, another question that I think ties in quite nicely um, with the question that was that was just asked, and, and Judge Davis, mm -hmm. you can you can answer this one, is um, what are what parameters are in place to ensure that independent parties do not become unruly in in order to preserve the parliament's const const constitutionality? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I mean, is, it, it, are, are you to, uh, is the questioner worried about what happened, what has happened over time, where where parties have just kind of run roughshod over the rules of parliament? I would imagine. I, I think. I think it's just in terms of the yeah the the, the general um, behaviour and actions and the way parties engage with with you know society and 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 well, well I mean, I, I, I think we saw we saw you know I, I think we saw parliament treated with an extraordinary level of disrespect. I should tell you that. Uh, that as the judge president of the competition appeal court for over 20 years, I had to go to the opening of parliament for most years. And sitting there behind uh, the speaker uh, and watching this, the, the, the senior judge of the country, there was something incredibly upsetting about seeing parliament degraded in that particular fashion. And I, I think that, again, it comes back to the earlier question. There should be a price for that, but that's a political price. And Ibrahim said something very important that I don't think should be lost in this debate. If we have a constituency system and we design the constituencies in a way that they don't just reflect one group, but that they actually reflect the diversity of South African society, each constituency, I think that makes a massive difference to the way in which parliamentarians are going to have to look, because they're not going to be able to, they'll lose seats, which they might otherwise not have if they behave in this fashion. So you have to up the sanction. But, 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 but you know, w should we not have been appalled by that behavior? You know, it doesn't matter that, um, you know, the vast majority of the country thought that Mr. Zuma, uh, you know, may sh well, we know from the polls, shouldn't have been president. And I suspect the vast majority of the country think that the trial should take place. And I think they probably thought that at the time. But that did not justify the kind of trashing of parliament that we saw. And in fact, it just totally undermines the, the institution. But the way you deal with that is there has to be a price for that. There never was. Mm -hmm. no, thank, thank you so much. Um Judge Davis, for for for, for that for that insight, I th uh, unfortunately we um, we have run out of time, um, so we won't be able to get into some other questions um, that our audience has. But I just like to just very briefly, I think, just wrap up. I think some some key com some key themes um, that have really um, 
come out come out of this conversation today um and i mean i think i think some of the other questions that unfortunately we couldn't get to came came um touched on aspects such as um inequality and um, inequalities of representation um and a lot of questions around accountability has has is also what the, what the audience um is is evidently very concerned about and i think tying in back into our, earlier into the into the conversation you know the speaking about what what is the role of 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 citizens when it when it comes and tying it back to this topic what is the role of citizens when it comes to 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 holding um leaders and 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 our our political leaders um accountable and i think it's something that one can based on whatever environment one one is in i mean especially students um thinking about their their representatives um and obviously thinking now based on this conversation how can you as 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 a student or even just um you know as a general citizen of, of south africa how can you take uh what this conversation has started um and and really take it back into your environments and and into your different contexts and thinking about what is the role you can play to bring about change within society i think is something i i think we we can all walk away with from this conversation so i'd like to just thank judge davis um for 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 joining us as well as ibrahim thank you so much um yes and over back over to to heidi and spurgeon thank you so much chris um judge davis and um Ibrahim as well as to you our audience for that robust engagement um just a few key things that I've um picked up in the conversation I think accountability 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 yes um so that is the key and I think importance of us as citizens to ensure that we keep um our leaders um accountable and just lastly as well acknowledging that we cannot rely on our electoral system alone So um the structure of the system as Ibrahim also said um how we structure it to ensure that we incentivize that people actually follow um the the um rules is is a great way of doing it but it's not enough. So thank you so much for that um conversation. I want to now um go over to just a little bit of entertainment. to one of our issue alumni miss nomvo kasolo who will share one of our poems one of her poems that she's written um so please sit back and enjoy the call when i first heard it everything was so clear the voice was loud and crystal clear and when i surveyed what it meant for my future I could not hide the feelings of excitement. The only issue was that this call demanded something from me. A response. A big yes. So as were they not scarce, I did not delay but accepted the call. For you see the caller had vowed by his life and name that he would be with me every step of the way, yet only I could actually begin and work the journey. So without wasting time, I jumped in so deep that going back was not really an option for I had heard what I heard. <laughs> and this believe it the ride was fun when everything made sense when I could actually see the different stops but then that soon faded when we entered the tunnel. The tunnel how to describe it i don't really know as much as i had to understand that it was all just part of the journey it's darkness and uncertainty made it feel like eternity so in desperation i begged the call countless times to choose someone else all because of the tunnel but he refused kicking and screaming i begged him to give the task to someone else but his response was always no he wanted to use me so you see i'm still going on and holding on not because i have everything figured out but because on the at the end of the call is a voice speaking telling me to keep going <laughs> physically i am blinded from the path ahead but i'm still going on because he chose me so purpose fear not for i am not denying my life calling thank you Wow, I'm sure you will agree with me that certainly gave me goosebumps. Thank you so much Nomvo Kasolo 
what an inspiring way um, to also add to our 10 year celebrations. Folks, the past decade would not have been made possible without the continued support of all our knowledge partners locally in South Africa and internationally, and specifically um, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. I would now like to welcome Henning Sur, who is the Conrad Adenauer Foundation representative in South Africa. Thank you, Henning. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate Frederick van Sals Labbert. Fittingly, we do so by considering his perhaps most important comp contribution to South Africa's society, and that is the report on electoral reform that carries his name. The theme of this evening is not academic. It has real-life consequences for all of us. The dramatic failure of political transparency and accountability in the democratic era has failed South Africa's population and especially its youth. Consider especially, but not only, a failed education system, catastrophic unemployment levels or blatant mass corruption. Dear young leaders, let's put some data to my words. The narrow unemployment rate for young people under the age of 24 was 63% at the end of the last year. There are about 5.5 million people under the age of 30 who are not in employment, education or training. And to contextualize this number in the electoral process in 2019, 10 million people voted for the ANC and 3.6 million for the DA. So these 5.5 million unemployed young South Africans could literally decide who governs in this country if they would go out and vote in masses. And this is my point tonight. To get change in a democracy, you have to vote. And the young people in South Africa do not vote sufficiently. Do you know how, how much of them actually go out and vote? In the last election in 2019, it was only 28%. So why actually should any politician care about young South Africans? They do not carry much political relevance because they decided to opt out of the electoral process. But only by voting change does happen. Whether you like the political parties on offer or not, but they are the ones who decide who govern. Protests in the street sometimes may work, sometimes they may seem to be attractive, but actually only rarely and briefly and in the end they do not guarantee any institutional change. In a democratic country like South Africa, votes decide who govern. And South Africa chose the ANC since 1994, with all its consequences by the way, be they positive or negative. So my message to you tonight is very simple. First, vote for change. And second, if electoral reform makes pe more people vote, if it generates more accountability and more transparency, then every Democrat must be definitely in favor of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Henning. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are now almost at the end of our evening. This honorary lecture would not have been possible with the help and assistance of many stakeholders as um, the Con um, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, as we've just heard from. So I want to call now on our director for, for the Center for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship, Ms. Tanya Overmeyer, to lead us in the vote of thanks. Over to you, Tanya. And that brings this wonderful event to a close. But as always, the conversation does not stop here. Thank you to all our participants for your interest and contribution. We hope that you are inspired to take your insights and to apply them to further engagement in your spaces of influence to Judge Dennis Davies for delivering the honorary lecture and to all our speakers. Thank you for catalyzing stimulating conversation. What a perfect way to honor the legacy of Frederick van Sales Slabbert.
to our sponsor, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, for your partnership over the years, as well as your financial support for this honorary lecture. To our donor, the A. Bailey Trust, for enabling us to expand our offerings to other higher education partners. They have been a key partner since the establishment of the Frederick van Sale Slabbert Institute. To all of our higher education partners, local and international, who are invested in creating learning opportunities with us for our student leaders globally. To the team behind the scenes, to the Frederick van Sale Slabbert team under the leadership of Heidi October. Thank you to this talented team and also to the extended team, the Center for Learning Technologies and Hink that executed behind the scenes. Your efforts in ensuring that the essence of the honorary lecture translates into an online setting is much appreciated. To the sleek, Center for Student Leadership, Experiential Education and Citizenship team, and to the wider Division of Student Affairs, and to our leader, Dr. Choice Maketa. Thank you. To our Stellenbosch University partners, Stellenbosch University International, to the Alumni Office, to the faculties, and Stellenbosch University management team for supporting our Frederick van Sales Labber team and the broader SLEEK team with our new vision of developing sustainable citizenship through experiential learning opportunities that enhances student belonging, integration and engagement. To our knowledge partners, our experiential educators, who are donors of time, talent, and skills. Thank you for co-creating short course content relevant to addressing societal issues in South Africa and globally. We hope that you have found this experience enriching. But most importantly, thank you to our students. Thank you for challenging for growing your role as active citizens by participating in leadership opportunities, for your caring, commitment and contribution as change agents. In your actions, great and small, you demonstrate that the hope that is invested in you for a stronger shared humanity will indeed be realized. Thank you so much, Tanya Overmeyer, and from our side too, for just sincerely expressing our gratitude to our audience, and specifically also for your guidance and your vision as the director of the center, and also ensuring that we maintain positive and passionate um, while we collaboratively work together with our students. Folks, we've come to the end of our program. Um, I believe that this um, is the first step uh, of a, a new vision uh, for us going forward. So 10 years behind us, are you ready for the next 10? I think I'm ready and actually more excited. And as we continue to live and to fulfill the legacy of Frederick van Sale Indeed. I would like to say thank you so much for staying with us until the end, and we look forward to engaging with you on many other occasions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>